Okay, our next assignment is assignment six, and it's quite different than what we've been doing. So far, we've been using other people's pixels in Photoshop and compositing them, learning how to transform them, rotate them, flip them, uh, erase from them, change their colors, change their, their values, change their lighting, make everything work together, animate with them, play with them. Now we're creating something that is our own. We are making our own image, but we are not using pixels. Instead, we are using vector imaging. And vector imaging is very different than pixels. It's based on um, plotting points and then plotting an arc or a straight line between those points. With those points, you define shapes, right? And those shapes are called paths. And then you can either fill in the path with like a solid color, a gradient color, even a texture, or you can outline the path by like putting an even kind of outline around or an uneven outline around it, or you can do both at once, right? So new formats are required. We're going to learn EPS format for this, which is kind of a, a portable vector format. And we will be posting it because vectors don't post online, right? Vectors are, are working files, not printing files. We have to save it as a vector file for our own use, but then output it as a PNG out of Photoshop in order to put it on the photo bucket. And the reason we use a PNG is because vectors are also, they support transparency. So you don't have to have white, a white rectangle behind your logo. That would be terrible, right? That would mean when you have a website that's mostly black, your logo would always have a white rectangle behind it. So you want to support transparency, just like PNGs. You are required to make an original logo, a black and white version and a color version that incorporates a theme or concept that the instructor selects. So sometimes I'll give you an assignment like Earth Day, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, or a service learning opportunity. The theme that Art Club has selected for this semester is insomnia cure. So something about sleep is an option for you if you need a theme. But I'm going to um, suggest that theme again for our spot illustration. So that's just something if you need one. You will then, uh, you are expected to start with an image or part of an image that already exists in the culture. So I was asked to do something as a Christmas gift, which was a, uh, a forking bull shirt because they thought that was funny. So let's see, what did I do? Where do I have it? So in my assignment folder for assignment six, I knew I was going to do something with forking bull. I just started collecting reference. So I want all of you to do some research as part of your process. And this is kind of just a generic logo design process. You can see it there. Um, you get your assignment, then you do a lot of research, and then from that research, you gather reference that's useful, and then you do the sketching and conceptualizing, right? So that's where we are right now, trying to figure out what we want to do, doing research, taking certain reference images from that research to base it on, and then sketching and conceptualizing, and then making revisions, which we'll do digitally, and then figuring out how to best present it, right? So in understanding how logos work, when you're doing research, you're going to see a bunch of different types of logos. And in a broad sense, this is one way of kind of breaking down a lot of different logo types. So an abstract mark means that at, on its own, the image isn't at all recognizable, but we come to associate it with the brand. Right, and that takes a long time. A mascot logo uses an actual kind of figure. So a lot of sports teams do this kind of thing. And they connect that figure with the identity of the brand. Uh, our campus has that. Nico the Nighthawk is our mascot. So what's nice about a mascot logo is that Nico can take on lots of various forms and it still represents the same brand. A combination mark uses both text and image together. And a combination mark is incredibly useful 
right? Most companies start out with that, but then eventually try to get away with just using the picture, right? Like early Apple logos always had Apple as part of them. But, and same with Nike, same with Starbucks. Eventually you can get rid of the text because then it's most powerful to just have the iconic logo, the picture logo. An emblem logo is, is kind of a more old school Western European thing, like coat of arms kind of thing. And we, we start to associate it with tradition. A letter mark is a really common type that we usually combine with a word mark as being what's called a logo type, right? And that's where it's just the letters make up the, the, um, the icon. So this is a little confusing. I don't need you to know all of these, but this is one way designers think about it. Instead, we're going to simplify it down to, let's see if I can get back to it. Here it is. To these different types. So underneath your assignment sheet, you will see I have a link to these slides in Google Slides, and we're going to build this together. So. I want you to think basically that there's three types of logo design that you can be inspired by. There are pictorial logos. So pictorial logos, you'll notice they do not rely on text to be understood for whatever reason, right? Over time, we understand what these are about. Logo types otherwise known as word mark logos, they rely primarily on text to be understood, right? So the Virgin logo here it has the circle around it, but it's not about the circle. You don't actually even need the circle. It's about how the text is, is arranged and that makes, makes the brand make sense. And then combined logos or combination marks, right? They rely on both image and text. But the problem with that is it's the most limiting for a designer, right? Because they have to have kind of two solutions put together. And what you'll notice is really successful branding like Nike, it went from, and this is what I grew up with in the 80s, it went from always having the swoosh with the logo type to eventually separating out just the logo type. So you just saw Nike everywhere, N-I-K-E. And then now just the swoosh, right? So you don't need those letters anymore. Uh, Chanel has never been able to separate, though it's tried really hard to have only this be its kind of iconic logo. But because it's so similar to other <laughs> brands, it's so minimalistic, it's needed to keep its, its text as well. And then Starbucks, similar to Nike, they've been really deliberate about slowly getting away, getting rid of text as they've developed. So now this is the logo. Now, if those are the three basic types, you are assigned for this project to do a pictorial logo, something that is primarily iconic. So we are not doing a lot of text to design yet. We'll be doing that later in, in another assignment. I think assignment eight is when we do text design and putting it together with an illustration. So the trick here is really having your image do all the work for you. And there are, there are three helpful basic design approaches, right? For the pictorial logo. The first is central symmetrical. And this is really true for all kinds of logos because what is a good logo? What words do you guys associate with a good logo? I'll put them here. We're going to build this together. What do you think? I have three in mind that I think are essential. Three words. You want to guess what they are? You're being videotaped at that. <laughs> You're being captured at that. Helps get you engaged and invested. Okay. What is it? Eye catching. Absolutely noticeable. So let's try that. 
And another word for that is engaging, right? It's going to stand out. Oh, the fun of formatting. All right. What else? And what does that mean to you? Okay. Ah, see that. I think we're getting something pretty important here. Now, ones that are already eye-catching and have become iconic, right? it's because they've become recognizable over time. Like Supreme is kind of a new one that just copied Barbara Kruger's kind of typeface, who's a graphic design artist, but has become <laughs> iconic in its own way, right? It's iconic for stealing other people's <laughs> design approaches. And so now it is recognizable and people will imitate it and it will have its own derivatives. Anything else? Memorable. Now, do you think in order for something to be memorable, does it help that it's overly complicated or does it help that it's really simple? Okay. Yeah, so simplicity helps, right? This is how this is different than an illustration. A logo is, is kind of a, a hitman kind of job. You know, you go in, you communicate really quickly. Anything else? Now, here's the thing. Think about how logos are used. Are they only used in one way? Or do you see them different sizes, different materials, you know, different colors? You see them on sides of trucks. You see them embroidered into hats. You see them on mouse pads. You see them on business cards. So they have to be versatile, right? So can we get this down to just three things to make them even more memorable that work for all of these? So I would say... Those three things might be clear, Let's see, because clear works for um, it's recognizable, right? Clear works for memorable and simple. Does clear work for eye-catching and engaging? Not necessarily, right? And if it's clear, it can be versatile, right? So let's say clear, engaging, and versatile. Is there anything we're missing? Those three? And those are kind of the three I'm thinking of. So that's our challenge. And I love having three because then you don't even need numbers. You just use bullet points, which are like my favorite thing ever. Why? Why do I like bullet points? Because they're clear, they're engaging, and they are versatile. I'm a big fan. Having formatting issues. Very bizarre. Things are not lining up the way they should. 